We are early in the year of 2024, and we already have some big news on the upcoming animated films that are releasing in theaters this year. Whether it be trailers, plot details, or simple promotional stills, I am going to give my impressions of this year's upcoming animated films based off any official promotional material involving those aspects or any little news slash details we have on said film so far. I will only be talking about theatrical animated films in this video, so movies that go directly to streaming, TV, or DVD will not be talked about in this video. My apologies if you were looking forward to movies like those, though that does not mean I will never talk about them in the future. With all of that said, let's take a sneak peek at some upcoming artistic cinema. Right off the bat, we are starting off with a sequel. Get ready to see some familiar faces, because we will be seeing quite a lot of those this year. To start with, we have the Kung Fu Panda franchise making its grand return with the fourth mainline film, which was announced all the way back in August of 2022. Wow, that was over a year ago? During that time, we really got no more news than the fact that it was indeed in production. For most of 2023, we wouldn't hear much more than a few details by Jack Plack during May at CinemaCon about the premise of the film. It was also revealed that Mike Mitchell would be directing the film, who took the same role in films such as Shrek Forever After, the Spongebob Squarepants movie Sponge Out of Water, and Trolls, which are all pretty good films if you ignore Trolls. In October of last year, we were also reminded that this would be one of the final films made entirely from DreamWorks Animation, as the studio is looking to move away from producing films in-house and rely more on third-party studios after 2024. So enjoy this last year of full DreamWorks glory, people, because after this year, a very sad downfall may occur. As far as the premise of the film, it is set to follow our lead role, Poe, taking a step up from being the Dragon Warrior, and is destined to be the new spiritual leader of the Valley of Peace. To fulfill his destiny, he ventures beyond the Valley of Peace to find his successor. During this journey, he is accompanied by a Corsic fox thief named Jen, and fights a new villain who goes by the name of the Chameleon, who has the power to shapeshift into any kung fu master, including Poe, and any of his past enemies. When I heard about this plot for the first time, I was really feeling optimistic about it. Kung Fu Panda is currently my favorite DreamWorks franchise right now, and watching this trailer only made me really hyped for this movie. The premise of this film involving Poe stepping up from being Dragon Warrior to spiritual leader would be a game changer for the franchise, and the world building so far looks pretty great, and that is probably one of this movie's strongest aspects, as all of the Kung Fu Panda films nail the world expansion every single time. The comedy and voice acting looked spot on as well, but if you want to talk about some real jaw-dropping stuff, the chameleon looks like an awesome villain. Now this is a common trend for the Kung Fu Panda series, but this one surprised me. Seeing Tai Lung for like 10 seconds in the trailer slapped a smile on my face, but when she just sucked away all his power and shifted into him, I was not expecting that, but damn. This only makes me think about how epic the action scenes are going to be in this movie. Yeah, it doesn't have Spider-Verse animations like Puss in Boots The Last Wish, but the action scenes in Kung Fu Panda are perfect on their own. Heck, I still think about Tai Lung's prison escape from the first film, which was released all the way back in 2008, and none of the other fight scenes in the sequels have been able to top it since. However, if there is one thing many fans were questioning in this trailer, where on earth are the Furious Five? To acknowledge this, Mike stated that they will make an appearance in the film, but they are off on their own individual missions. From reading this, I could assume that they are probably going to be written to the side, which may sound a little disappointing, but to be fair, they didn't really do much in the third film besides Tigress. Regardless, it, do it doesn't take away my excitement for this movie at all, and you can guarantee I will be there in the theaters watching on day one. Next, we have If. This movie will be our first, but not last, live-action CGI hybrid film we will be talking about in this video. The premise revolves around a girl named B, played by Kaylee Fleming, who gains the ability to see other people's imaginary friends, referred to as Ifs for short. 
who have been abandoned or forgotten by their respective kids. After discovering this, she also learns that her neighbor Deadpool, I'm sorry, the man upstairs, played by Ryan Reynolds, also possesses this ability. With this ability in common, the two team up on a journey to reconnect the ifs with their respective kids. Right off the bat, people immediately started comparing this with the premise of the 2003 Cartoon Network series, Foster's Home for Imaginary Friends, where the plot of the show revolves around a sort of retirement home for imaginary friends who are lost or outgrown by their kid. This movie seems to feature a similar concept, but in the form of a film instead of a TV show. And instead of being fully animated, it is live action with the ifs being fully CGI animated. Do they look good in this style? Well, yes. The big purple Steve Carell monster looks good, and that one looks like it came from Cuphead looks neat as well. And the overall CGI just looks pleasant. Plus, a reunion between Steve Carell and John Krasinski is an office-style treat that I'm all in for. Overall, I am optimistic for this Foster's Home live-action remake, and I'm curious to see how this unfolds. As if his hype of being included in an unfortunately ignored Smash clone wasn't enough, the big orange feline is finally making his grand return to the big screen after almost two decades. As someone who was born in the 2000s, I grew up with the CGI movies, show, and live action movies starring Bill Murray and Frank Welker. I really loved them as a kid, and I would watch the Garfield show nonstop. Now that I have reached my adult age, I look back on this era of Garfield and see it as some of the ugliest garbage I have ever laid my eyes upon. Yeah, I'm sorry, but it really pains me to admit that the standalone official Garfield projects have not really been good since the 90s, with the only pieces of Garfield media worth checking out today are the 1988 series Garfield and Friends, its specials, and most of the classic comics. Does this new movie show any signs of returning to that golden age? I apologize in advance. The eating you're about to see will not be pretty. And if you have young children, this would be a good time for them to leave the room. The end of 2021 was quite a ride for Chris Pratt's reputation, as not only did the internet lose it over the announcement of him voicing Mario in that September Nintendo Direct, but the already uneasy crowd went nuts a few months later when it was announced that he would be voicing Garth in his upcoming movie. However, there seems to be a slight difference when it comes to both of their feedback. When Mario's voice was first revealed, most people were not happy with it because it almost sounded like Chris Pratt was putting absolutely no effort to sound like the iconic Charles Martinet voice of the character we all know and love. However, it's me, Mario! Ah, spaghetti. Ah, ravioli. Some people had a different viewpoint, stating that they did hear an Italian slash Brooklyn accent in his voice, and as more trailers and clips released, that claim was becoming more believable to most, to the point where it didn't even seem like an issue for most people who have seen the movie upon its release. When it came to Garfield, however, the reaction seemed to be worse. And that is because if you watch the trailer for yourself, Chris Pratt's regular voice seems to be much more noticeable, and it doesn't even closely resemble Lorenzo Music, Frank Welker, or Bill Murray's impressions. Sure, you could say Chris does sound a bit more mellow than he usually does, which is true to some extent, but to people like me, it still sounds a lot like vanilla Chris Pratt and not Garfield in the slightest. Okay, enough of me ranting about a random celebrity being in an unfit role for no reason for the upteenth time. How does the premise of this movie look? Well, believe it or not, the Garfield movie is going to be a heist film. To be a little more specific, the movie is going to be another one of those road trip movies involving Garfield unexpectedly reuniting with his father, Vic, played by Samuel L. Jackson, and goes on a crazy adventure with stuff such as jumping a train and being kicked into a Garfield balloon? They're really going out with all the fan service, huh? 
Not just that, but this movie also looks to be a retelling of Garfield's origins, something that many movie adaptations of classic cartoons have a habit of doing. We see the character as a baby, they find their destined person or location, and then they grow up to be the iconic character we all know and love. This trope isn't a bad thing most of the time, but it's still something I'd like to point out. The last thing I want to talk about, which may sound a little nitpicky, but just like most modern Garfield media, they sort of misunderstand the character by having him actually talk instead of speaking with his mind. I know a ton of people may disagree, but taking place from the perspective of his mind is what made him so unique in the first place. If there are some good things I could say about this movie so far, I do like the animation. I mean, hey, it's the first time CGI Garfield doesn't look like ass, so that's pretty game-changing. I know the road trip plot sounds cliche, but the film focusing on Garfield's relationship with his father sounds like an interesting concept to me. I don't think I'm expecting this movie to be great, but I'll definitely be there when it releases in May. And what do you know, we have another sequel on our radar, this time it's from Pixar, which should not shock you because the studio is under Disney's belt after all, though in this case, it's understandable. Inside Out was easily one of Pixar's most beloved films in the 2010s, and it's very easy to see why. This movie follows the fantastic trend of what if blank had feelings that Pixar movies are known for, and just rides with it. With Inside Out, the audience gets a glimpse of what is going on inside of 11-year-old Riley's head, and just like everyone in the real world, her actions are controlled by her emotions. Throughout the entirety of the film, we see Riley's emotions go on a trip as she struggles to settle into her new life after moving from her childhood home. The movie's biggest strength comes from its pure concepts alone. The idea of these emotions being created at the moment of your birth and more coming into your life as it goes on is executed perfectly in this movie. This movie also just nails the tiny details of the meaning of your emotions. And the more you think about it, the more you realize just how smart the writing aspect is of this movie. Every emotion you have, whether it's positive or negative, is important in some way. You won't always be happy in life, and your feelings will change depending on what you experience, and that's okay. We see Riley learn this in the first movie by viewing the journey she goes through inside this creative world taking place in her head that drastically changes as she falls into depression. And the craziest part about it, she was only 11 years old in the first movie, and the sequel sees us looking at a teenage Riley who has just entered that era of her life at age 13, and her mind and body are going through huge changes, which means new emotions of course. As for the official teaser trailer, we get to see a glimpse of teenage Riley, along with a new emotion called Anxiety, who mentions she is not the only newbie. Before we find out, the teaser ends, with the only hints being the slogan saying the feel envious, annoy, and embarrassed movie of 2024. Plus, if you look at the teaser poster of the film, you can see Anxiety, along with the three others I mentioned. Hmm. With all these new emotions, could we possibly have a PANIC ATTACK SCENE? A real one though. Animation Twitter, can you please stop making good things look like a joke for once? Overall, I'm really looking forward to Inside Out 2. We may not have gotten too much outside of the teaser, but with the extra details we have gotten outside of it, I'm really positive that it's not only going to be another home run for Pixar, but it will also make Inside Out one of their strongest franchises in general. So far, we have talked about two sequels, and they both look really promising. Huh, maybe a year with lots of sequels won't be so bad. Another Despicable Me movie, which is actually the sixth film in the franchise if you count those two Minion spin-off movies. This franchise has been around for 14 years now, and it's getting sequels at a faster rate than Ice Age. But hey, are any of the movies good? Well, the first movie was, because it actually had heart and soul put into its writing. The characters were all likable, the minions were just side comic relief characters, the score was good, and of course it had Vector. What more do I need to say? Despicable Me 2 was decent. It did do something that made it worthwhile by giving Gru a romantic partner. It didn't really hold my interest for a handful of the movie, but at least it was an okay inclusion. The villain is El Macho, and he's a good-looking Victoria's Secret supermodel. The minions were a little oversaturated, but they weren't really annoying yet. 
Oh, speaking of Minions, Minions is one of the most nothing movies I've ever seen in my life. It is literally a 91 minute Facebook video with almost no effort put into its script whatsoever. This is one of those movies that is just a complete embarrassment to the entire medium of animation. And the fact that it made over $1 billion in the box office is just sad. This movie did not deserve to reach the same milestone as Toy Story 3 and Zootopia in the slightest. Then again, most animated movies to reach this milestone aren't very good, so there's that. Despicable Me 3 is another film that did absurdly well, and guess what? This movie is nothing as well! Yay! These movies are totally giving animation a good name, guys. To sum it up, this movie introduced Gru's brother, Drew, who is incredibly annoying and to some extent worse than the Minions. Speaking of the Minions, they are incredibly pointless in this movie and serve zero purpose. There is one scene where they are all in prison, and there are scenes that depict them in the showers butt-ass naked and even getting ass tattoos. The villain is voiced by none other than Trey Parker, and he is somehow less entertaining than Vector and El Macho. The main characters aren't even interesting in this one, and they wrote off Dr. Nefario because of course they did. The most ironic thing about all this though, is that Gru is more interesting in the second Minions movie, The Rise of Gru. I would personally give this one an award for not being nothing. There is actually stuff to enjoy and be invested in. There is actually somewhat of a plot. Congratulations Minions The Rise of Gru, you are the third best movie in the franchise. Okay, so now let's discuss Despicable Me 4 and just get this section done. Despicable Me 4 revolves around Gru and Lucy having a baby. Oh my god, he fu- Yeah, I honestly don't care though. To be fair, this movie does do at least something interesting, but it's still kind of pointless. Why do we need a story about Gru trying to get one of his kids to like him? Didn't the first movie do something like that when it came to his relationship with Margot? Why would I need a story of him doing something similar with an infant? If there's one thing to take away from this trailer, it's that Will Ferrell does voice the villain and he sounds great so far. It really brings me back to 2010, when Megamind and the first Despicable Me were both released in the same year, and both were villain redemption stories. Is this the semi-crossover that was destined to be? Oh, and there is another horny minion scene where one of them gets stuck in a vending machine, and the other starts slapping his ass. Peak cinema right here. Moana 2 is a movie that many people are not pleased with, and I can sort of understand why. In 2020, there was an announcement by Walt Disney Animation Studios' chief creative officer, Jennifer Lee, that there would be a Moana TV series coming exclusively to Disney+. Plus. Okay, a show sounds interesting. That would give the team behind this franchise some room to expand the world of this universe while also introducing new characters and settings that the first movie didn't have time to really explore. Not just that, but over the course of the episodes, they'll have plenty of room to flesh out the main characters, while also having time to make other side characters interesting. That sounds fu- oh. Oh. Now I can see why. Now don't get me wrong, a Moana sequel isn't a bad idea, but there could be one fatal flaw that this movie might share with something like Raya and the Last Dragon, and that is the fact that they might rush new location introductions, may just feel like filler, and I won't really get invested in them. I feel like all the positives I mentioned with the Moana TV show may all be toned down or removed just because of the decision to turn it into a full-fledged sequel. If there are some reassuring things I could say about this, is that Auli Cravalho and Dwayne Johnson will also be returning as Moana and Maui, respectively, Ma and Mark Mancina and Apatiai Fuai, I'm sorry if I pronounced that wrong, will be returning to compose a score. Unfortunately, though, Manuel Miranda, who wrote the musical numbers in the first movie, won't be returning. Well, I hope the new songwriter can live up to these masterpieces. That's really all the news we have outside of the not even 20 second teaser that is just Moana blowing a conch. Once again, I will keep an open mind for this movie, but if it turns out to be another Ralph Breaks the Internet type deal, I'm going to be disappointed. I think we all know some shiny dude needs to return though. <sighs> Why does this movie need to exist? Why did the 2019 remake need to exist outside of the obvious? 
Why is it the highest grossing animated film of all time? It doesn't deserve that status. It doesn't even deserve to be in the top 50 or top 100 or any of lists involving high status or praise in any shape or form. Why does a movie based on this generic lion that looks nothing like Mufasa exist? This is just a lion you could find in a nature documentary from National Geographic. This isn't even based off the Lion King. It is based off some zookeepers training these lions to try and reenact the 1994 classic. And what do you know? They couldn't do it. Hey Disney, just because a product you made earned you a ton of money doesn't mean it was good. Oh well, anything that makes you the slightest bit of dough, right? What is this movie about? According to Wikipedia, this movie revolves around Rafiki telling Kiara the story of her grandfather Mufasa when he was a cub, and Timon and Pumbaa add commentary to it. To sum it up, this movie is going to be a remake of Lion King 1.5, except it's a commentary over not Mufasa's backstory with Billy Meerkat and Seth Borgen. I don't want to watch this, and you shouldn't either. Ah, thank goodness we're ending off this video with a movie I'm actually excited for. You see, the reason the live-action CGI Sonic the Hedgehog movies work is because there are actual effort put into the designs of the titular characters and its location that actually represents those from the games as well. The characters are even written in a similar fashion to the games, which gives you the hint that the writers actually care about making a good movie instead of making a profit. As for what we have so far in this cinematic universe, the first movie was just okay in my opinion. I thought Sonic's design and character were cool, but the overall package kind of felt way too close to another generic buddy-buddy road trip movie that has been done so many times in the past. Jim Carrey as Dr. Eggman is a 10 out of 10 though, that's the truth. The second movie is a little flawed in pacing and humor, but it is such a fun movie that's better than the original in almost every way. I love the way this movie introduces Tails and Knuckles into this universe, and the action scenes are mesmerizingly good for a movie like this. When I saw the end of that movie, I was already hyped for Sonic 3 and how it was going to introduce Shadow. We don't have any official news outside of the movie's logo, and the fact that Maria is going to be in the movie, meaning us Sonic fans are probably going to hell. But in terms of predictions, I think introducing characters like Amy Rose, Cream the Rabbit, Rouge the Bat, Omega, and even Metal Sonic would be smart choices. As far as locations go, this movie better contain City Escape in the beginning, and locations from Sonic Adventure 2 would be nice touch as well. So yeah, I'm pretty hyped for this movie overall and the more news we get, I'm expecting it to probably rise. From what we are seeing so far, 2024's animated films look pretty decent. Yeah, we may be looking at a handful of sequels, especially ones that shouldn't exist at all, but I think the good outweigh the bad so far. This year is going to be quite an interesting one to say the least, and I'm looking forward to talking about them as they release. Anyways, which animated film are you looking forward to the most this year? Don't forget to follow me on sites such as Twitter for updates, spicy memes, and takes. I also have a letterbox where I talk about movies, and you can see my thoughts on some I don't really have time to talk about on the channel. Let me know in the comment section down below what you think, and remember to keep calm and let life carry you on.